My name is Jeffrey Fleur, and my presentation is on Arrakis. The operating system is the control plane. So to start my talk, I would like to first discuss the whole idea of what a traditional operating system is. So as we all probably all know, the traditional model of the operating system provides an abstraction of the underlying hardware and also mediates between the application layer and the hardware layer. So this mediation actually has a few purposes. One of them is process isolation. That is, um, it protects the processes from having any deleterious effects on the hardware, as, as well as pr provides a network and disk security. So many people um, are willing to accept this um, actual cost because if to acquire pure performance, there's a little bit of overhead with this kernel traversal. And uh, placing the app, this abstraction layer between the, the user space and the hardware space uh, incurs a performance cost. But, but often, m many people are quite satisfied with this level of performance cost. So now we get to t talking a little bit more about the cost of crossing from the user space to the hardware space. So to begin this consideration, let's consider the humble UDP echo server. So that's a server in which the network hardware receives a UDP packet, sends that packet all the way up through the kernel to the user space, and then the user space simply provides a quick acknowledgement all the way back to hardware space. To break down the cost of this, the authors of this paper broke, broke down four distinct places where there's costs in this kernel traversal. The first one is a network stack. And as it turns out, that's the dominant source of latency and throughput cost. But there's also three others, schedule overhead, kernel crossings, and the copying of packet data. In this paper that they present on Arrakis, they try to address all four of these different um, kernel overhead costs. So, the motivation of their paper is that there is a new new hardware virtualization technology that they really can leverage the ability for the user space to bypass the kernel space and still provide all the protections and all the process isolation that they had before while increasing the IO performance. So where IO performance is a de desirable commodity, is in situations like data centers where there's just a lot of IO happening. Um, if there's something as uh, simple as a, uh, a NoSQL service or um, any kind of key value store or web service, all these different services it constitute a large amount of IO. So what this paper really examines in terms of IO, tries to focus on is, is networking and data storage. So the, the case under study that, that they provide is they, they generate this Arrakis operating system that intends to reduce the IO costs and increase throughput and latency, and they compare that with a version of Linux. Now, the interesting thing they do, which I think is really cool about this paper, is that they don't just take vanilla Linux off a of distribution and then compare their tuned version of Arrakis. What they actually do is they tune the Linux to make the, fair, the comparison a little bit more fair. So let's look at the traditional OS architecture. So this is a very simplified schematic, but I think it shows us what we're really, really need, what we're really looking at here. So, so the user space sits on top, and that's where the application and the libraries reside, and they interface with the kernel space through system calls. And that system call, um, those things uh, go through a trap when they go to the kernel and they go through an interface and then those system calls can then drive the kernel interners, internals and the drivers. So in the kernel space, you have that isolation provided for the user space so that the hardware never actually sees a direct interface to the user space. And then the kernel internals 
then then drive that hardware and the hardware can then vice versa drive the kernel uh, when IO is received send it uh, back through some kind of uh, interface or system call interface back up to the applications so the architecture that that um, the authors um, propose is a little different and what you notice is the kernel space is pushed um, from the vertical path and pushed horizontally over to the right. So now there's a slightly different architecture in the sense that the application now sits on top of the hardware space. And the way they, they do that is they provide that libOS a box right under the application, which provides a kind of interface. But what they also do is um, to maintain all the guarantees and protections and um, uh, process isolation, they, they have the application talk to the kernel, but via a different band path to, their, to what they call a control plane. So in, their, in the new Arrakis model, and to support that architecture in the previous slide, there's a need to provide a new abstraction to support it because they have, they have changed the architecture of the whole OS model. So, so there has to be a new interface and abstraction to support that. Fortunately, um, since the application now talks to the hardware, there are some, there are some IO adapters that support a virtualized IO that really enables this model. And what they do is, is these new hardware actually can expose virtual interfaces that provide support. So um, previously, rather than the kernel talking directly to uh, the hardware itself, now these hardwares can now spin up little virtual uh, pieces of hardware. And those virtual pieces of hardware can now provide the interface for the, for the uh, user space and also provide protections as well. So going back to the Arrakis hardware model, uh, I want to start and focus on each different new piece uh, in turn, and then start with the uh, virtual interface card uh, from the start. For the virtual interface card, um, the new abstraction that, that has to take place, um, it needs to happen both in the case of a network device and a storage device. It, it needs to, the, this model needs to support both types of hardware. What that means is, it's, it's, this is a general, more generic abstraction than just a, a, piece of, a piece of network gear or a piece of, or a RAID. It needs, to, it needs to look like, it can look like either one at this point. And then there'll be some specific differences between them. But what this, what this abstraction does, it supports some common items between the two, uh, such as queues for uh, send and receive uh, between the application and the hardware. For protection, um, this could be either access control or um, any kind of uh, bandwidth limit, or it can also be uh, I/O scheduling. And um, what we're going to see is a lot of that, a lot of that hardware support is currently out there to perform these kind of these kind of um, these kind of needs. So the queues themselves, they're they're really they're there for send and receive. And what we see is by, by put them at, putting them at this level, we really bypass a lot of the overhead. And that's what we're gonna see later in this. But they support direct DMA, which means that we could potentially gain a lot more throughput and a lot less latency. So bandwidth allocation, that's another thing that should be enforced for the IO as well. And what this does is um, it prevents um, uh, anyway um, a malicious user or a buggy piece of software from just causing congestion in the network or just um, trying to hog up hog up a PCI bus for whatever reason. And uh, one other thing that needs to happen is is transmit receive filtering. Um, what we don't want to allow is the applications just to be able to spoof at will without any, any kind of oversight uh, from the kernel. And that should get enforced at the hardware level. Um, there's these uh, 
lower level abstractions called virtual storage areas. And uh, they, they need to be stored, supported for storage devices for the mapping of actual storage area. So that needs to be supported by the actual, actual physical device. Let's now look at the support and limitations of what's currently out there in hardware. So for network cards, um, the authors are in pretty good shape because there's a technology called SR IOV. And that really possesses most of the key elements for this model. Um, so it really has the ability to support and sub spin up a lot of virtual interfaces. It supports um, some of the protection schemes. And it also provides um, a lot of the low level functionality that, that these authors need. Um, Unfortunately, like with every technology, it doesn't possess every, all our needs altogether. Um, the filtering mechanisms right now for, for many hardware cards are pretty limited. Um, for example, the, the filtering right now, although we'd like to, to have it very fine-grained and be able to limit, limit the uh, user space from accessing any port or, or sending or receiving from from any IP address right now, some of them can only filter based on MAC address. So it's a little bit unfortunate. But um, but right now, the, the authors, they kind of roll with that in the hopes that maybe the technology will come. Storage controllers provide some, some parts needed to provide this model. Um, unfortunately, probably not even as close there as network cards are. Um, the number of V6, our virtual storage interface cards, often quite limited to a value of about 64 interfaces. Um, past that, um, the authors provided some emulation. So when you go above the um, applications requiring more than 64 interfaces, which may be quite common in a lot of applications, they saw this in emulation. Now that we covered the virtual interface card, let's move to the control plane. That's the box in red. So the control plane abstraction. Now that the kernel has been moved out of the direct I.O. path between the application and the hardware, its responsibilities are slightly modified. So now the application um, now has direct communication with the uh, virtual network interface card. Um, there's still some responsibilities that the kernel needs to provide. And, and what that does is it acts more like the control plane. Uh, you can think of it like the control plane as in network switches. So what this does, um, rather than um, set up forwarding tables though, <laughs> and network switches, this actually approves and disapproves requests. So when the, when the application needs some storage space or when it needs a um, network socket, it goes to the control plane, which is in the kernel, and the kernel can then, the control plane can then disapprove or approve those requests. So what this does is it, it lets us have our cake, cake and eat it too. So it provides and, and enforces that access control. So it also pr provides that resource limiting, which uh, is a protection that allows um, the kernel to maintain um, stability so that no application can just hog up the whole system. Um, it also provides global naming. So as you recall, now that the applications really control the storage space, the whole idea of, of the whole fi virtual file system is a little bit changed a little bit. Um, now that uh, certain applications will own those chunks, the question is, how does another application access something on a different application storage space? So we're going to get to that in a minute. So once the control plane prepares each VIX for its settings, then the control plane is kind of done, and then the I.O. can happen um, as it's supposed to. So let's go to that hitch of the global naming. Um, so, so the problem is with global naming is we are now associating storage areas with different applications. And so that means an application like Redis uh, might have some configuration files. It, it may have its um, uh, the, the, the database where it stores um, all, all its uh, NoSQL, NoSQL information. All of that will be in its, in its storage area. The problem is that's 
that can be owned by the that particular application. And if another application needs to read it or write to it or whatever, it's not so obvious what to do because previously the virtual file system in Linux owns everything. And then everyone just had an equal right to that, you know, based on user privileges. So we need a little slightly, they, the authors needed a slightly different architecture for this file system. Um, this is solved by a rather clever um, application of exporting names to the virtual file system. So the virtual file system is still there, um, but rather than actually manage the files themselves directly, what it does is it, it has, it, it, it can export names. And then if an application say needs to read, say Emacs needs to read something from a configuration file of another application, what it does is exports that name as a remote mount point and say Emacs, that other application can then act on those other files. It's a little tricky, but, but that's how they solved it. After discussing the virtual interface card, um, I thought we'd discuss the libOS, and the libOS is in the uh, within the uh, block in red. That's the interface uh, that the application has to the hardware itself. So um, this is the data plane interface, and there are two different VICs to have to interface with. Um, the VNICs, which are correspond to the network devices, and the V6, which correspond to the storage devices. So the Racket system provides an interface to deal with these two different types of devices. And again, there's some commonality between the two, but there's also some little fine-tuned differences. So the interface between the application and that is, again, it's called libOS and it's customizable. So based on the needs that the application has with the interface it's connected to, these things can either be um, increased in functionality or dumbed down. Um, so if you don't need some functionality, um, you can kind of fine tune that libOS a little bit and, and maybe gain a little bit of better performance. So let's talk about the, uh, the, v, the VNIX, the network interface cards. And uh, what that does is it sets up queues and that's one of its main roles. And then these queues can be used to uh, uh, filter packets out based on the requirements of the control plane. Uh, they also be set up to do zero copy. So basically the, the, network, the network device can directly copy the queue and then make that, make that, that data you know, in that queue directly available to the application then vice versa on a send, meaning that you don't even have, you have a zero copy cost on IO transfer in, in the network. That can make it quite fast. Uh, for the storage device, slightly different different uh, thing, but it's roughly the same theme. What that does is it, it, it can, it's an interface for read writing and flushing hardware caches within the virtual storage areas. These virtual storage areas are abstractions at lower level within the uh, uh, storage device. And uh, this has a lot of uses, but basically it tags data to a given application, but it also, these things can be shared, allowed for inter process sharing. Okay, let's talk about the results um, of, of the, of the uh, paper that they show. I'm gonna, there's five cases that they really covered. I'm just gonna cover the first three due to, uh, <clears throat> due to expediency. But I want you to see at the bottom, the highlight result. <clears throat> and that is that, the Redis store had a two times better read latency, a five times better write latency, and a nine times better write throughput uh, for a comparable uh, Linux um, um, application. Now, I'll say this, which I thought was really interesting. They didn't just take bland Linux out of the box and then compare their tuned system to that. They actually went down and tried to tune Linux itself to try to make it a more fair comparison. And I thought that was a very good thing that they that they mentioned because um, usually people, um, when they want to show their results, don't bother to do that and try to skew <laughs> skew for their own benefit. So I thought that was really cool. Um, the first thing is the uh, UDP echo server. Uh, again, this thing is a low weight return. Uh, you notice that on the uh, horizontal axis, the processing time, that's the time spent in the application where it just kind of delays before it sends back. What you see is,
There's two types of Arrakis and one type of Linux. The, the P stands for POSIX. The N stands for they have a flavor of Arrakis that violates POSIX slightly to gain a, a much higher gain. And that has to do with uh, zero copy. And uh, what you see is if they're willing to get away slightly from the POSIX standard, um, you can clearly see that, that they're nearly nearly at line rate uh, for their system. You can see it compared them to the driver and it's, it's almost in the noise. But, but even still, if they stay with POSIX, they have so many gains in, in, in that kernel and bypassing the kernel that they're, they're getting close to about two to three times faster. So that's, that's excellent. And as you see, the processing time goes down, obviously. The throughput will go down, obviously. But you see that, that Arrakis still scales well. Um, so this is for the Memcached D key value store. I don't have a big background in the Memcached D, unfortunately. But I think you can clearly see um, that for this key value store that Arrakis does perform quite well. And they don't do the non-POSIX here. They just did the POSIX here. But they also compared against using Linux threads and just straight Linux processes. And you can see clearly that not only, not only do they perform better, but they also scale better than Linux, which I think is really cool. They, they do... They do go have a bit of a hit when they when they go to six cores, and that has to do with some. Uh, they use a operating system called Barrelfish as a as a base, and that um, causes some overhead. So that that is what they told me told what the cause. Uh, we'll just hit the NoSQL store real quick. You can see for Redis, uh, gets and sets um, in terms of throughput better. It's, you know, uh, obviously. Arrakis is really, really does well at, at the gets and uh, even the sets, it's still outperforming Linux significantly. So with that, um, talking about the pros of this paper, um, it was a very well written paper. Um, generally speaking for this class, I'm sure all these papers are going to be um, amazing, but this one was uh, pretty, pretty good. I mean, this one actually was awarded at that ODSI conference. And um, uh, what I was really impressed with is the references were particularly useful in the sense that um, um, I, it's an open source code. I mean, you can download it if you want, but they, what they really do is, uh, if you really want to know the nitty gritty details of, of why they made certain decisions and, and what the cost benefits were, the, the, the references were very good at, at um, allowing one to get to that information. And uh, one other I think, I, I, idea I really like and that is, um, if you're going to produce a, a good idea, usually it's a reimagination of a previously successful idea, <laughs> and and that is the separation of control and, and action architecture. Is kind of they, I, I again they didn't state it, but I, I think it's uh, pretty, I think it's clear to me that you know they, they they looked at the network architecture how that works and they said well okay can we can we make use of that and uh, I think that's a good strategy. Um, so I think that's definitely a pro. Of, that, that what they did was that, you know, if, if you want something successful, sometimes you look at copy a little bit what other people did that work. Um, some of the things that uh, I'd say cons, but they were brutally honest is, is that the hardware functionality probably isn't here yet for this stuff, but who knows, perhaps someday that this will gain traction. They do have emulation and a lot of this stuff does work pretty well right now. Um, you, you can see by the results, but, but I, think, uh, I think some of the protections issues would probably have to be pretty sewed up before a lot of uh, companies would take a lot of risk on this. Um, at least my company would. Um, and that um, the issue I have probably the biggest con of this kind of approach though is um, by taking a kernel out of the runtime of the, of the data plane and kind of putting it more on the hardware, if the hardware has issues, is inconsistent or things like that, it's going to be a little bit harder to trap that when you're just trying to gain pure speed. So people might, in practice, might have a lot more issues with tracking that down and, and want to, maybe want to find a compromise. So um, the impact of operating systems I see right now um, is uh, as data throughputs can be more and more of a limiting factor uh, for different disciplines. Um, um, that this could be a very, very, very useful, useful approach. Um, you know, people want to spend less money on their infrastructure and want to get more out. So, yeah, some applications that could uh, leverage this gaming platforms. They like to spend low cost, high performance on machines. Um, 
maybe I don't know where what what the internals of some of the common gaming platforms I know they like to run at, at a pretty low level uh, but I don't know if they take this approach I doubt it and uh, if they did they could even gain that much uh, higher speed and maybe make their games run that much cooler so uh, other things uh, that I that probably I, I work on personally is real-time control platforms sometimes we're trying to control stuff at a very high speed uh, microsecond level and uh, th this could be a good little thing um, Right now, we most use FPGA technology because people complain about what they call hard processor technology as being too slow. Uh, maybe this can solve that, the input-output problem at least. Uh, yeah, I think something like this will be a matter of time before it gets implemented. Um, and uh, it, in some way, I don't think it's going to overnight, we're going to get rid of Linux and, and take on Arrakis. But um, I, I think certainly the main lines will, will want to try this and uh, try to approach this in, in, you know, over the next decade. Any questions? Um, about a minute over, but uh, if you need questions answered, uh, you can contact me at the uh, email and uh, just a little uh, attention getter that the professor likes us to put in. And I'll just show you a photo of my backyard. So uh, it's easy to mow and uh, it's not, not, not too bad when the leaves fall. All right, thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye.